Let's resume the meeting of September 16th, 2013. City Attorney, anything to report out? Uh, the City Council met at 6 o'clock in closed session for a conference with labor negotiator and direction was given to the negotiator. Thank you very much. Vice Mayor Scutini, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you very much. Roll call, please. Councilmember Valdivia? Here. Councilmember Friend? Present. Mayor Velasquez? Here. Councilmember Scatini? Here. Councilmember Gomez? Here. Interim City Manager Abra? Present. Interim City Attorney Mall? Here. Chief of Police Westrick? Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Verification of agenda posting. The agenda for the City Council meeting of September 16th was posted on the bulletin board at City Hall on September 12, 2013 at 10.50 a.m. for Government Code Section 54954.2. Thank you very much. Uh, the recognition of the uh, baseball team, we're going to move to a future date. October 7th. October 7th. Thank you very much. Let's move on to item A, consent resolution. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, if I can, staff would like to pull item A6 for clarification. Okay. Are there any other items council would like to pull? A7. A7. I move that we approve items A1 through A9 with the exception of A6 and A7. Uh -huh. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Let's discuss A6. Good evening, Your Honor, Council Members. Um, it was discovered that there was a typo in the staff report for A6. Um, the proposed uh, potential uh, revenue increase for the airport would be $960, not $11,000. Um, only have two annual leases out there, and I went into autopilot and multiplied the annual amount times 12, and that's how I came up with that number. So I apologize. The amount on the lease itself is correct. So. Um, it, there's no corrections that need to be made there. So we're clear. What was that? What would that number be monthly? Nine hundred and sixty dollars a year. So a year. A year. This is the same rate that the uh, spray fields butt pay. It's fallow land that's inside of safety zones that cannot be developed for any other reason than the taxiway, and the only purpose of this taxiway would be to access Mr. Lindsay's property. Is he in the audience tonight? He is not. He's had a family issue that he's dealing with. Okay. I just had a question for him. So, Council Member Gomez? Um, no, and th there was another item that um, Mr. Richmond brought to you, or actually had a concern on. I don't know if uh, Marty's going to speak on this item, but can you clarify that uh, item, the, the second portion um, of his questions? This lease is a 55-year lease, um, which is the maximum permitted. Once again, the only purpose of this area would be to service this property. Um, and there is, uh, the, there was some concern about the developer sitting on this lease and holding it hostage for that period of time. There's a, no, you didn't. <laughs> but uh, uh, there's a 30 day cancellation clause in there if, should the city decide that we need to construct the taxiway. Okay. Either way, it has to be taxiway. Yeah, and I think that was, uh, I'm glad Marty brought that up. And I think it's, it's nice to be, you know, at least uh, feel reassured that if we did, though I don't know where the heck we would get money to do that, <laughs> uh, we, we, can, we can move forward with that. So that was uh, all I had. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Council Member Scutini? <clears throat> uh, I just had a, a question for Ken Lindsay. Uh, I, I met with him last week, and he's not here tonight, and I'll, I'll take it up with him when he gets back from his, his family deal. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Councilmember Friend. So the typo is only on the the uh, on the resolution itself. It says 55 years at 960 per month. The, that is the typo. That's where you're going to make the change. The lease itself is correct. It's a year. Okay. Councilmember Valdivia. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
there a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve A6. There's a first and a second. All in favor? Second. Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. We'll move on to item A7. Um, yeah, thanks, Rudy. Um, I don't know if I really have a question. Uh, Rudy has more, more of, a, of, of a statement. And it's just because of stuff that I've seen in, in other places um, um, from speaking to other people that are in transportation as well. Um, I think that um, um, I think a, a lighted crosswalk, even though I understand that, you know, Hazel Hawkins installed uh, that one a few years back. But uh, from what I've heard in the industry, and you may know a little bit more than I do, but um, there seems to be some companies that have worked on these type of crosswalks that have actually gone out of business. Mm -hmm. And these seem to be, lighted crosswalks seem to be sort of the old phase, the, the old way of, of constructing enhanced crosswalks. Um, the new style of enhanced crosswalks um, have either bulb out curb ex extensions, uh, pedestrian uh, refuge islands in the middle of the roadway, and they have flashing beacons. Um, so I, I think, personally, I think that's the way we need to go with the, with the new uh, um, enhanced crosswalk on West and, uh, and 4th Street. Um, I, I, I think that we may get in trouble in the future if we construct this uh, lighted crosswalk um, and then have to, uh, in, in, in the work that I do, we've actually had to remove four of these crosswalks already. Um, so we have had to dig it out take all, all, all the lights, all the wiring, and replace them with um, flashing beacons. So um, I'm not going to support this item today just because um, I think it's a great idea, but I don't think this is the right, um, uh, right use for, uh, uh, for, for the money. And uh, honestly, I think it, it could actually be done cheaper if we used um, uh, another style of, of enhancing a, a crosswalk there and keeping the pedestrians safe. So that's all I have to say. Maybe you could help us by explaining or answering the questions or the points Councilmember Gomez was pointing out there. Are these things prone to failure? I've heard the same issues with these, so I'm um, very curious. Time, very, excuse me, um, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, uh, there have been <coughs> difficulties associated with a specific manufacturer of the in-ground lighted crosswalks. Um, Actually, today we received notice of their entering into bankruptcy with regard to replacement of many of those products. Um, the products that we've chosen for this installation um, are a better hardened installation, and, and we shouldn't see the type of failures that we've seen at the high school. Um, both the high school and the hospital have spot products installed, and the uh, hospital seems to be you know, surviving itself, but we've had nothing but difficulties at the high school. Um, this particular location, again, we're, we're moving toward a different installation, different products um, that have greater track record, better track record. Um, in conjunction with the in-ground lighted walk, there will be advanced warning beacons on signs that do flash in advance as well, too. So it's a combination system. Um, I think agreement with the county was made quite some time ago as the lighted crosswalks were the preferred installation at this particular location. So we've, we've merely followed forward or have followed the, the direction we've received for that installation. Um, we believe it'll be a good installation itself. Um, unfortunately, there's not enough sunlight on that corner to accommodate solar installations. So we, we do have a hard wire connection for that location. Um, but at this point, it's our recommendation to move forward with the lighted crosswalk as proposed. Um, Mr. Mayor, I have a quick question yes. just to follow Mr. up. Gomez. Um, so you, you said that the signage, so the signage at the, at the one that we installed or that was installed in front of the hospital is only embedded lighting. Um, it does not have um, the actual flashing. So you have your, your PED sign mm -hmm. and then you have the outside lighting, um, LED lighting. So you're saying that this one will have both the LED flashing lights, That's the correct. beacons, mm -hmm. Along and the embedded lights. That's correct. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Scutini. <clears throat> I think that I think it's it's a, it's a hope the court uh, encouraged people to use the crosswalk. I mean the uh, underpass. We just allowed I don't know ten thousand dollars yeah. to to uh, 
to <coughs> make that a beautification and lighting, and it's going to be a real nice uh, project when it's done. And I think that will be a big help, too, also for people crossing that street. I think we should encourage people to do that by signage, too. Tell them there is a underpass. That's we'll all right. Thank you. Council Member Friend? No, I have no question. Council Member Valdivia? Were we, uh, are we, were we supposed to have a light put there, crossing from traffic light at Monterey Street? Street. Um, but, no, not at Monterey, over here on where the courthouse, West where West the county Street. building is, mm -hmm. and then crossing over because right there, even now, it is not safe. And once we get the, the, the courthouse opens, uh, there's going to be more activity. And I understand we were discussing that in the past about the possibility of having a uh, I like there because the crosswalk, if it doesn't work, it's going to have to be pulled off, and then we're going to have to decide to to put in a, 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 a light. I think it would be better to to see if we can do that to put in a light there <coughs> for safety purposes. Because mm -hmm. it's because people are just, when they're coming from this way, they're just picking up speed. When they're coming from the other side, they're barely slowing down to come in, and it's dangerous right now. It's going to be worse. Uh, you're, you're very per perceptive on the past um, studies that have been performed regarding regional transportation and, and the discussions have been held for a signal at that location as well too. Currently it is not um, situated as a priority for an, an installation within the near future. In other words, it is non-warranted for installation with the exception of the pedestrian issue. Um, pedestrian safety at this point is the concern. Um, and if the signal should meet signal warrants um, for combined activities being vehicular volumes and pedestrian um, circulation, then we will be we making those recommendations. Sometimes that's what happens. They wait until somebody, somebody gets hurt and it's better to prevent that. And not mm -hmm. everybody's going to be able to use the dungeon because people with mobility problems or whatever, mm -hmm. they're going to be able to climb down and over there. I mean, it's going to be more for the people that are more mobile. No, those like are all. Generation, et cetera. That's correct. So I think what the stuff that I would really like to put there, I, we need a light stuff there, not you know lights on the door. Mm -hmm. We're talking about because it's a dangerous. Even yes, now sir. it is, and it's going to be worse. And I don't know what process we would have to go through to see about that getting there. Thank you, Mr. I, I I agree with Councilmember Gomez, Councilmember Valdivia. I, I think. We're going to spend this money and find ourselves ripping this thing out in a few years when we realize it's not doing what it's intended to do, um, whether that be the, the lights failing or people getting run over by people ignoring blinking lights on the, on the road. So I think I would rather see us send this back, look for a better alternative. I think you know, there's been discussion of a light. Um, I don't know what that would cost us at this point, but maybe there's other alternatives we can look at that can provide us a little more safety for that crossing. That will be a busy crossing. If we're not slowing that traffic down, we're going to have problems. Uh, um, you know, a signal at that, in, at that intersection is, is probably close to a $200,000 installation, $250,000. Um, in terms of the re regional mitigation fee program itself, it's pretty low on the priority list. So. Funding a signal at that location may be a challenge for the council within the immediate future. So um, this, I, I believe, again, by consensus with the county courts, um, with the COG itself, as the COG has earmarked the funding for installation of a crosswalk itself, and staff is simply making the recommendations to move forward with what consensus has brought us forward to to this day. So if it is the council's preference to move to the investigations of a warrant for a signal installation, then we shall do that. But it is, again, significantly more expensive. And it will also um, be a delay in, in, in the installation itself uh, with the courthouse anticipating their occupancy in late December, I believe. Uh -huh. Um, so we're trying to time this so as to provide the pedestrian safety for the opening of the courthouse. And our long-range planning, of course, is still focused on a signal system. But at this point, it's, it's been the city's diplomacy um, to obligate the funding through the COG for installation of the lighted crosswalk. And again, we're merely following through with those past commitments. Right. Councilmember Gomez had another 
Yeah, I thought. I, believe. <clears throat> I think that we what we may want to do, and and I think, uh, I believe uh, both you and Councilmember Valdivia bring up a pretty valid point. You know, if we're talking about the light there, um, and we it's not on the top of our of our of our priority, then what we need to do is request a list of the um, signal um, what we are what has actually already been warranted as signalized intersections, bring that to staff, um, have staff bring it to the council so we can look at those at those priorities. Um, it sounds like we have some concerns with what is uh, priority and what is not, so why not relook at it, you know? We have a new mayor, we have, uh, we have concerns change and people change <coughs> and habits change and construction takes place. You know, so there's a lot of things that have changed um, over over the t over that time period, and we may want to revisit mm -hmm. our um, our priority our signal priority list. So um, I would recommend that that we ask staff to to bring that back so we could take a look at that. Um, and you know, I I'm, I I guess I'm happy to see that that it does incorporate. And I'm, I apologize, I didn't want to take this long on on this item, but um, I'm happy to hear that it does incorporate the LED lights on the actual signage. I think that's great. Um, uh, it's a intersection where um, it's an it's an intersection that you have you have line of sight issues already. So if you're a pedestrian traveling south, north, or north south on that crosswalk at that intersection, not only do you have traffic to look at coming east west. You know, some of these pedestrian enhanced crosswalks are in the middle of a block, okay? So you have two things to worry about. You have left, right, left, cross, or sorry, look back and then cross, okay? Um, this intersection here, not only do you have the right, left, right, left, but you also have to look back. You have to look forward at what's coming in front of you. So that's another concern that, that we have. Um, so, and I apologize that you're the one standing here, Rudy, because a lot of the stuff was no, already that's done that's prior to you even, even uh, being here or talked about before you were even here. But, um, uh, and we were all, I believe, supportive of having an enhanced lighted crosswalk uh, between uh, the county block and the new, uh, and Steve's new home. But um, <laughs> I don't think we were, um, I don't think, personally, at least, uh, I don't think this is exactly what I was envisioning. Um, so um, I, I think there are some things that could be done. So that's that's the only reason I brought it up. Okay. Councilmember Friend. I do remember <clears throat> when we were looking at the first part of the construction and approving the construction that Doug did report out about a, an extensive study that was done on the, both those intersections, and they did not meet in any way the criteria that's required, both traffic-wise pedestrian wise and additional traffic that the new courthouses mm -hmm. could it's generate it, it fell way short of all the norms that everybody was looking for to put a, a, a lighted intersection there um, so I think it's going to be something that we need to look at but I think it's also going to be something that's going to come from the city and not we're not going to get much help anywhere else it's going to be a city burden and I know the last light we put in was about three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Right. For okay. the full intersection, and there was a big timing issue between <coughs> the one that's right at San Felipe and and Fourth, and then not a real city block distance between the next light. And there's going to be backup mm -hmm. because the coordination of those lights is going to be very difficult. Because you have a lot of traffic going north south on San Felipe, and if they're making left turns to go west on Fourth Street, they're going to be backed up quite a ways because of the coordination. So I'm not saying we shouldn't look at it. I'm just saying I remember the study that was done when they first brought it. The well, when they, when so they those comments are accurate. And, and they'll was, bring back traffic. It was five years ago. I understand that. But mm -hmm. things have changed. So we should what look at it. Council Member Scatini. <clears throat> I was going to say what we can reduce the speed through there too. Also, I think it's speed 35 miles an hour through there. Am I correct on that? The speeds are speed zones are set on the based upon a process of a speed zone survey, and they're t they're always um, legally challenged unless you.
perform a, a, a legal engineering survey, basically, which sets the speed zone at the five mile per hour increment at or nearest to the 85th percentile. And there's some jeopardy in doing a speed zone survey and that your speeds may actually increase. So we, we can't arbitrarily set speed zones um, or that mitigates the police department's ability to use radar enforcement. <laughs> so there, there are a number of, of traffic calming measures that can be um, looked at. The um, council member friend, um, I think, tagged it quite accurately with regard to the warrant analysis and the proximity of a signal at Monterey um, to the 4th Street and, and San Felipe intersection in a sense. When, when a pedestrian hits that button, it sets the whole traffic pattern in the controller um, in a priority to the pedestrian. So every time that ped button's pushed, it, it, it causes a delay for everybody waiting in a vehicle at that intersection. So if you look a couple intersections back, we're going to be stacking traffic up at peak hour, which then throws our intersection into a, a failing level of service mode. Um, so with regard to the investigations and what the engineers will look at, um, again, I, I am quite certain that those studies um, will show that the signal is not necessarily a good solution for that intersection. I'm meeting to put speed bumps. <laughs> again, I think uh, the best bet here would be to look at this again, look at a few more options I think we have. Maybe we do have the issue with the light, but we're having a potential issue with failure of these mm -hmm. other lights, which just can cause a larger problem later. I think obviously, you know, COGS is paying for this, but at the same time, just because we're paying for it doesn't mean we should just go out and do something that might come back in a few years. That let's just do it right. Let's look at it one more time. Maybe there's something we could, a better alternative. Okay, now if council will recall within the recent past they have authorized the um, bidding for installation of these products that we're requesting funding for purchase at this particular time. So th this action then will, we will pull that bid out from, from public bidding process. Okay. Is there a motion for how we want to proceed? Well, I, I, I think me and Lachortha to proceed with with it right now, and we can look at it somewhere down the line, but I make the motion that we approve resolution 2013-142 at this time. Okay, is there a second? I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Shall we proceed? Thank proceed. You. Thank you, Reed. Move forward with item B1. I make a motion that we approve. I make a motion that we approve items B1. Second. This motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Move on to item C, public input. This is time for anyone in the audience to speak on any item not on the agenda within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council. When the city clerk calls your name, please come to the podium, state your name and city for the record, and speak to the city council. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Please note that state law prohibits the city council from discussing or taking action on any item not on the agenda. Do we have any speakers? Marty Richmond. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council of Marty Richmond from Hollister. Uh, I'm always highly appreciative of the Council's uh, support uh, of the veterans uh, locally and nationally uh, of veterans. Uh, as many of you know, there, um, there is a home being built here in Hollister for a disabled veteran who was uh, severely injured um, while he was on duty. And that home is over on uh, 254 Rosebud Avenue in Hollister. And uh, many of you have also probably received the same invitation I did, which is that next Saturday, I believe it is, September the 21st, 
between 8.30 and 12.30, there will be a, uh, a get-together at, at that location at uh, 254 Rosebud Avenue in Hollister to help uh, put in some of the uh, lawn and uh, other uh, uh, outside um, items on, on the home. For those who are not familiar with it, and some in the audience may not be, these homes are specially built for people with disabilities who are veterans and receive those disabilities uh, from being wounded or severely injured and that uh, they, they get the home at no cost to them. I think it's a terrific program. The, uh, uh, I don't come up here often asking you to join or donate anything, you know that. But uh, if you can't make it or you prefer not to haul a rake around, I, uh, I encourage people to go uh, to the uh, website uh, homes for our troops. It's H F O T homes for our troops. That is USA dot org, and make a donation. Um, the charity involved here, Homes for Our Troops, is five star rated or four star rated from Charity Navigator, and from other charity rating organizations because they use almost all of their money to benefit the recipients. Uh, this will be for uh, uh, Sergeant Brian. Jurgens and his family, who was uh, severely injured in active duty. I appreciate uh, you giving me an opportunity to present that. I'm not an official spokesman from Home for Our Troops, but I feel this is a very worthwhile uh, item. I, uh, I've often seen uh, during previous meetings some of you out there, and I know that the county uh, officials come the same way to express their support. So thank you for your time. Thank, thank you very much. much. I'd like to mention, Marty, that that group has now done over 160 of these homes nationwide. Thank you. We're hoping for 300 by the end of next year. That's great. Awesome. Are there any other speakers? Yes, Dana Lysinger. Dana Lysinger. I've come here today to talk about the parking at Lad Lane School. And I agreed to help with my niece picking her up at school this summer and was rewarded with a $58 ticket because I parked where it said no parking. <coughs> but with all the other parents who've been parking there for the, this is the third year she's been going there, and the limited time, I thought there was maybe a tacit agreement with the city or the police or something because there is nowhere to park. It is incredi incredibly limited. And I really would encourage you to go out there at 3 o'clock one day and try and find a parking spot. I went half an hour early last week. There was one car in front of the farmhouse with a wheel up off the air because there's just nowhere to park. And there has got to be something to be done about this. I don't know why. Across from the school, it's not just no parking. It's no stopping. But believe you me, the parents are out there parking. You know, they want to make sure their children are safely inside the school instead of just dropping them off two blocks away. So I don't know what can be done, and I'm going to pursue this further. This was the first thing since I just got the ticket, and I will pay the ticket, of course. However, I would encourage you, please go out there at 3 o'clock and see what a mess it is, because something needs to be done. Thank you. I just want to add, so you know, something's being done right now. And you can thank your chief here for doing a lot of research on it. So okay. thank you very much. No other speakers? Okay, let's move on to item D1. <sighs> Update on the courthouse? That's huge. That Your honorable. Cell D1. Cell D1. Your A1. On and other that. things. <laughs> You're A1 to everybody else. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, folks, for uh, allowing the Superior Court to. Uh, some time on your agenda to to update you on the state of the judiciary, specifically the courthouse I want to focus on. Uh, as the uh, presiding judge of our superior court, it's important that we ha keep our justice partners informed about what's going on in the courts. And I think I'd like to just take really a brief moment and uh, to talk about why you're a justice partner, because I think a lot of people wouldn't suspect that. What's the relationship between the uh, court and the city? Um, we actually interface in many different ways, as you all know. We, uh, we interface in, in the fact that, uh, well, the courts are the, 
the uh, location where disputes arising out of city laws are resolved, if there are any disputes. Uh, secondly, citizens who may believe that they are victims of, of crime, they call the fellow right over there through your 911 uh, system. And uh, ultimately, uh, any uh, disputes that might arise as a result of somebody believing they may be a victim of violent crime or crime of any nature uh, end up in our, our courtrooms. Uh, and, and I'm on call 24-7, so I get to see some of these folks at really interesting hours of the night, too. Uh, we interface in that way. And more specifically to the, the issue at hand is that we interface in the sense that uh, you have been an integral part of the uh, existence of the courthouse that's just under construction and just about to be occupied, as we've been hearing about earlier. Um, you uh, have been, you know, an integral part, as I said, uh, both the existing uh, members and uh, past members as well. Some of you have been here from time one. I think uh, Councilman Scatini, you've been, I think, from, from day one of the, the process, and, and perhaps uh, Councilman Valdivia as well, I believe. Um, and uh, you've been key to this whole uh, situation. In fact, this, I started uh, about 11 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, with the process of, of uh, trying to get this new courthouse constructed. Uh, actually, back in the 90s, we knew that we were going to need a courthouse. Uh, and when I started about 10 or 12 years ago, um, I came over and talked to one of your city managers, uh, George Lewis then, um, who this takes back a while. So uh, we, we had a nice discussion and, and George was be able to be helpful to our uh, target and it began all the way through. You were members of our uh, committee, the uh, project advisory group. Uh, we started off with uh, Councilman Pike, Brad Pike. Uh, Councilman Doug Emerson were uh, <laughs> another members, um, as were your former city manager, Mr. Clint uh, Quilter. So, uh, and I have to, and, and lest anybody forgets, you were the instrumental organization that has caused our courthouse to be downtown. And uh, those of you who believe that that's an important part, which I think most of our community does, really salute you. So uh, uh, it's important that uh, People recognize you're our justice partners, and uh, I want to thank you for being a good partner, first of all, so thanks. Um, <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> as I said, this has been a long process, about an 11, 10 year process that I've been going through. We started off in good times, um, when the, when the um, budgets weren't so bad. As you know, California and all the local agencies such as yourself and state government that I represent um, has fallen on hard times for the last few years. You're, you're, you're dealing with that daily, so are we. Uh, in fact, um, just last year, or let's say recently, uh, the state legislature, to balance what was then a deficit, uh, looked to the courts to, to help out. Uh, they took around $260 million from the court system statewide. Um, they have since uh, restored about $60 million, so we're only about $200 million shy right now from where we were prior to a couple of years ago. Um, in, in the way they did it, they basically um, restricted our ability to have reserves. They reduced us down to 1% to reserves. Um, they basically adopted a budget so that they cut our allocations so we had to utilize our reserves to make up that difference. What it meant was we lost uh, roughly about $1.4 million that would have been uh, the benefit of our local constituents. Um, and we have the rest of our reserves that we had been saving for the rainy day. Um, will be taken away if we don't have a use for them. We do have lots of uses for them, uh, and there will be additional uh, need for our local contribution for the courthouse as well, besides the fact that the state is essentially funding the courthouse. Um, so that's uh, something that we have to worry about. Um, we, will, we will expect several hundred thousand dollars in our alloc annual allocation, a reduction of that amount. But we're still open, and in fact, we're getting ready to open the new courthouse. Um, we have suffered substantial staff reductions to address the reductions in our allocation through layoffs, attrition, and the like. Um, but we'll, we believe we'll be able to remain open without any major service interruptions. Uh, this is not without current challenges. Just uh, last week, I believe, or earlier this week, uh, SB 5, or AB 566 was passed. Uh, that's a bill that will probably have a major impact statewide on the judicial branch. Locally, it could cost uh, nearly $100,000 or more 
of reduction in our uh, amount. So we're waiting to see that. In fact, we're getting ready to mount a campaign to address the governor to hopefully be veto that uh, bill. Uh, but let's turn to the more positive. We have a new courthouse going. It was uh, constructed. We just got under the wire um, before the, uh, the project was approved. Bonds were sold just before uh, basically the state courthouse construction uh, process has been shut down. So we were very lucky. We, um, we have a very aged uh, structure. When the state took over the obligation to house courts from the county, which was an unusual arrangement, but that's the way it was for time immemorial, um, the state took it over and they decided they'd survey all of the courthouses they were going to get from all of the counties. And uh, out of 220 inadequate facilities, we were number eight on the worst and uh, for, pur for purposes of providing judicial services. Now, we knew we had some problems and we were really uh, happy that we came out eight because we knew there was a good likelihood that we would get some funding and true enough, we got in under the wire as I said. So we're happy to say that uh, that funding came through at the right time. Uh, had we been about a month or two later, you would not see anything on that site but a bunch of weeds probably. So um, it's, it, we're very fortunate here locally to have that. And again, a good deal of that fortune is attributed to your actions. Um, the nature of the building. It's a 42,000 roughly square foot facility, two story. Uh, three courtroom, one jury assembly room that will also operate as a, as a uh, hearing room. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it um, will provide us for expansion for a fourth courtroom should such be necessary. We anticipate this court um, facility will be probably the last one we'll get this century if uh, finances are such that we believe uh, the way the state of California is. So we're hoping that it will, will benefit and we've done everything we can to, to design it to that uh, need. Uh, let me show you a couple pictures here. Actually, you can probably go over and it looks a lot like this now. <laughs> They're coming along quite rapidly and Gil has a couple of uh, <coughs> photos that I can show. And I can show everybody, if you haven't been by 4th <coughs> Street, You'll kind of see this without the people here, unless they have hard hats because of the workers right now. Um, and as you can see, this is an interesting uh, picture because it depicts a couple of important points. You'll notice that its entire south facade is glass. Um, now, you know, the designers, and I, you know, I love people who design things. I'm really impressed with them. I'm not one of those. And uh, the designers say, you know, how do you want to, what, what do you think about the court? They ask you things like that. And say, well, it's everybody's court. Justice is transparent. And so they do things like that. They made a really nice facility. Um, it is passive solar, if you will. We expect that we'll be, we will be LEED certified. The question is we're hovering between gold and silver right now. So we'll find out where we're at when we conclude. And we're very pleased that it will be a LEED certified building. Um, it is a passive solar design, if you see. The uh, solar or the glass in the south allows the entry of sunlight in the winter to reduce the need for heating. And there's an overhang that you're just now installing <coughs> that is designed to be at the right angle with the right opaqueness. It's actually glass too, but it's actually printed glass. That's another thing I learned from designers. It basically, it's a sandwich of uh, some sort of plastic material between layers of glass, and it's printed. So. Um, it, it can be designed to reduce a certain amount of light. Uh, this is designed so that it's at the right angle with the right amount of reduction of light so that during the sun, it will reduce the heating uh, demands on the building so it will reduce the, the need for cooling. And so it is a passive design, a solar design. Um, it will have updated security. It will have a secure area for our in custody uh, defendants. It will uh, provide then safety for the people who are attending court as well as the, the uh, safety of the in custody defendants. It's uh, slated uh, <clears throat> for completion, as someone mentioned, uh, around the beginning of November. We anticipate we'll be occupying the facility in uh, roughly the first of the year. We hope to have an open house. We will have an open house. We will invite you and everybody else and the members of our public to join us and we'll give tours so that you can find your way around and hopefully find your way to the, uh, the justice facilities that, that will be at your disposal to settle your disputes peaceably. And uh, that's kind of a summary of it. 
I'm happy to answer any questions. And I want to really, again, thank you all. And anybody um, who I've mentioned, uh, failed to mention, um, uh, you know you, you're out there, so you know who you are. Thanks. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Council Member Scatini. Uh, Judge, <clears throat> who's going to clean those windows? Gil. <laughs> Good job. For no, I, I have to tell you this. The windows were a, a never-ending source of problems. Our architects designed these things. That's the first thing we said. Wait a minute here. Who's going to clean, especially the overhang? Right. Um, and they said, we have new product. It's called self-cleaning glass. Now, I want some of that glass for my own place, but uh, uh, we'll see how well it works. Um, it was designed. It's really a multinational. We did our best to get as much construction uh, process to the local, and as you recall, I've I, I reported on that, and we took a lot of pains to try to get as many local businesses involved in the construction because uh, we felt that it's important to try to bring the jobs to home. Uh, not everything could. This was very specialized glass. They actually constructed a portion of the um, cleaning uh, out of Germany. It was shipped over, uh, over the Atlantic to Canada through the Great Lakes, made its way by rail to British Columbia where it was fabricated, and then back down here, and ultimately it was in the... Um, Port of Oakland just about a week ago, and uh, we were making sure that they came. So it's a bit multinational, a big, uh, a big production, and uh, so we're we're always impressed about what the the designers come up with. Wow. So, yeah, thank you. Wa I guess uh, water will clean it on its own. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We shall yeah. see. Councilmember Gomez. Yeah, no, I just want to say uh, thanks, uh, Steve, for the update, and Gil for always keeping us, always keeping us posted and in the progress of, of what was going on there. I think overall this council is probably really excited uh, because of the location. And yeah, ultimately the redevelopment agency and you guys and everybody working together just, that's what we were looking for. You know, you know it's been a win-win. That was what we started off. When I sat down with the county years ago, we sat down and we said, look, we know the county's gonna have to pay for the course. So we were trying to figure that out. Right in the middle of that process, the uh, law change in the state <coughs> took over. And then when they did that, though, they were going to charge the county a huge sum. Could have been several, I don't know, millions of dollars perhaps. We, we really never got that number. And so in order to avoid the county having to pay any money to the state for uh, basically the inadequate facility, we, we tried to come up with a way, and the city was there. Uh, city came up with the, the land. Uh, they made the exchange with the county, and you know, all know the, the arrangement of that. It was a great uh, mutually beneficial. It was a win-win. Yeah. It was a collaboration between the, the city, the county, and the uh, state of California, along with our local courts. So it shows you, uh, even in hard times, can get done. Yeah. And uh, I think the people of the community are well served by, uh, you know, your, your predecessors and you. Uh, for your your uh, foresight. Yeah, we um, yeah absolutely. I, I completely agree with uh, with your assessment of it. I think, you know, as a back then redevelopment agency, um, we completed the purpose. You know, I mean, the whole purpose was to maintain and keep these um, st structures or do these enhancements uh, in the redevelopment district and have an impact uh, just like this one. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't been the case in some of our other redevelopment agency purchases, but at least on this one, it's uh, it's been a, a very good a very good turnout. Um, looking forward to the uh, open house as well. Um, I hope that's the only and last time I ever see the inside of your uh, courthouse. Nobody um, ever wants to see me business wise. Yeah, no, we don't care. Though, though I did, we just got a, a get out of jail free coin from the chief. <laughs> so this one might, I don't know if it works with you. And you know what, when you go to the chief's jail or the chief's court, it'll work. But otherwise, I don't know that it's going to have much effect. So. Uh, and anyway, other than that, my brother Gus sends his uh, jealousy from the Pasadena courthouse. Uh, we're, we'll try not to rub it in too much. Yes. I do have to point out that you, you mentioned guilt keeping up. And, and frankly, um, all the efforts, and in, in my uh, colleague, uh, Judge Harry Tobias, and has been you know, tirelessly working on this too. And, uh, but, but we have to give credit to Gil. Uh, you know, this community is so lucky to have Gil at the courthouse, and uh, he's working, you know, night and day for us and uh, for the community, and he, this would not be a reality without him, so uh, yeah. he's, he's a, you know, principal player in this whole thing. Did he get a pay raise? That's the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> you, got a you know, I, yeah, what can I tell you? No, he just does it for the love of the community. <laughs> Council Member of LD. No, I just want to thank you for the presentation. It's wonderful, and, and it's great to hear that we're almost there. Yeah. That's almost done. I just want to share with you my favorite part has been everything's great. 
one day I was passing, I passed, there were no trees, all of a sudden, boom, instant garden. It was <laughs> it, wonderful. <laughs> it was surprising. I didn't realize they were going to do that all at once, and we looked over, and like you said, I instant told my garden. Husband, I go, you, look, you should look and buy an, an instant tree. You don't have to plant it when it's small. Oh. They have full, full grown trees. <laughs> we spend it's going to look nice. Yeah, it is. And they, they really did a nice job in terms of the size of the trees, yeah. but I have to tell mm -hmm. you, we actually cut those down. Uh, <laughs> we went to a, uh, I spent, 10 hours on a value engineering session uh, with Gil and our, and our uh, uh, court supervisor, Nancy Eiler, and uh, they had 80 some odd people there. Mm -hmm. and this is an interesting process where we spent 10 hours and we cut around $2 million off of the uh, project. Mm -hmm. And one of them was to cut the trees back. So I thought they were going to be like that big, but I, I, I hesitate to think what they would have been <laughs> like great. if we hadn't <laughs> cut it back. Um, but they're, they're, we're very lucky to have that. And we're going to love to have you as neighbors. Yeah. I'm, I, I want to apologize, too, because I know you've probably been feeling a lot of rumbling uh, over the no, early no, no, part. No, no, It's great. It's, it's, it's fun to watch it, to see it just emerge, and all of a sudden it looks yeah. like it's almost going to be done. Yeah. Well, Thank we'll just you. wave at you from our back there. <laughs> Thank you. Councilmember Friend. No, I just want to thank Judge Sanders for coming and, and giving us the update. I know it's... He's got a busy schedule, too, so I know. And any time you have any questions, please feel free. I'm happy to, I, I love to get out and answer questions about uh, the courts. And, uh, you know, we can talk, I can talk another three or four hours on AB 109 if you'd like. But, uh, <laughs> well, it's probably not agenda. I said, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was kind of hesitant. When I hear all these Brown Act, you know, this is from a past life, and I was just like, God, that sounds familiar. Well, we'd rather have you come here and talk to us than us come to you. you. <laughs> Fair enough. I understand that. <laughs> Your Honor, thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Thank you. Uh, no other questions? Wanted, yeah, when are you going to put the stoplight out there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you, you I have mean, extra money for that. Right, right after Gil gets the windows clean, we're going to send him out with a little <laughs> red sign. <laughs> well, thank you. Like I said, he does everything. Thank you very much for the All update, right. Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Sanders. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Let's move forward to item E1. It's a public hearing on resolution number 2013-145. If you would like to speak on this item, you will have up to five minutes to speak on the item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, good evening. In 2009, the Planning Commission of the City of Hollister awarded 175 residential allocation units to the Rakovich project, which is, uh, consists of 22.25 acres and it is located um, on the east side of the Sam Nudo Street extension, north of the proposed west side boulevard extension. And 100 of those 175 residential allocations were actually awarded for future affordable multifamily residential on a five acre site of those 22.25 acres. In addition, the application for residential allocations identified a small pocket park to be constructed the, developer, the developers considering moving forward with the project. In fact, um, we are currently processing a tentative map, but only for the single family residential portion of, of, the, of the project. And um, at, at the applicant has requested that the park element be removed and be replaced with six additional allocations. Um, so therefore, instead of having 75 single family residential allocations and one uh, small pocket park, have um, a total of 81 single family residential um, allocations with, without a pocket park. On July 25th, 2013, the City of Hollister Planning Commission denied the request for six additional residential allocations to replace a proposed pocket park and um, an appeal of the Planning Commission action was submitted to the City of Hollister on August 9th, 2013. The applicant's proposal to remove the pocket park is in direct response to the City of Hollister's Parks Master Plan. The request for six additional residential allocation units in return for removing the pocket park has its merits. The Parks Master Plan encourages five acre or larger parks within, within a half mile walking distance rather than, rather than smaller parks because the smaller parks cannot allow any of any recreational amenities such as softball fields, tennis courts, picnic areas, and walking trails. In addition, all parks, whether large or small, require periodic upkeeping, and the creation of additional smaller pocket parks result in an increase of park maintenance routes for staff. These routes include loading and unloading of equipment and travel time. The Rakovich 22 project is not a private development. Therefore, the project was intended to be dedicated to the city. 
And with this, staff recommends that the City Council hold a hearing to consider an appeal of Planning Commission denial of growth management allocation application number 2009-8. Staff recommends that the City Council grant the applicant six additional residential allocations for the Rakovich 22 tentative map. Are there any questions for staff? And also the applicant is here as well, if you have questions for him. Council Member Gomez. Yeah, well, I'm kind of surprised because we have like a ton of money to spend on park maintenance right now. <laughs> so, well, some people got that at least. But. I do. So, um, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not totally surprised, but quickly, um, I didn't see it under, but what was the actual size of the, of the park? Or what is, was? It was six, was. It was six six lots that were probably what, right about 5,000. Five, okay. So they're about around 30,000. 30, yeah. Foot park. yeah, it okay. was to be one, eight, about almost one acre or so approximately. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, no, that was the only question I had. Thank you. Appreciate it. Council Member Cicatini. So he wants to do away with the park and put six additional units. Is that a no park at all? That is. That's correct. And, and one of the things I, I think that the council needs to remember here is, again, I think we've, we've kind of addressed the, the fiscal impacts of having small pocket parks. They're, they are very difficult for us to maintain. Um, you folks can drive around the Las Brisas and some of the other ones and see um, th that they are just difficult. And again, keeping consistent with the City of Hollister's Park Master Plan that um, the council has adopted, it really is striving for those, those five acre parks. Keep in mind too that um, the, the council adopted a park impact fee uh, a few years back. So these, there's, there's two components of the park impact fee. These units will be paying a park acquisition fee um, and they're also going to be paying a park construction fee. Um, and to combine, it's right around $5,000 per door. Um, so what you're going to say, or per unit or per lot, however you want to say it. So what you're getting in return for the pocket park or the removal of it is you're getting six units, but you're also getting that $30,000 to help contribute to uh, the city buying those larger parks um, and, and things that are easier for us to maintain. Again, um, I think, uh, you know, mobilization is, is usually what they call it in the industry from a construction perspective and whether or not you go out and you mow a 30,000 square foot park or a three, you know, a three acre park, there's no, the time is exactly the same. And, and that's one of the things that we just need to be more considerate of. Um, so as Jill and Abraham mentioned, and, and this kind of started out as, as, as my project and I apologize for, for interrupting them because they're doing a great job. Um, but really the idea is, is that this is not necessarily the best deal for the city of Hollister. Um, moving forward to, 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 to require these pocket parks. Now, in a private development, which there are some of those coming down the line, uh, uh, private uh, developments that are, are part of an HOA and they're going to be responsible for maintaining them, this, the city would love that. That's not a problem. Thank so, you. So if I hear you correctly, then uh, and didn't quite answer my question, I hear you correctly, then you agreed to do away with the pocket park? Yes, sir. And, and allow the uh, Six units? Yes, sir. At $5,000 a pop, so that's $30,000. You can use that money for a new other park. parks? Yeah, for a, for a larger park. Okay. Or make improvements to existing parks. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Council Member Friend? Um, yeah, and normally, like you know, I don't like to go against the planning department, planning commission, because I know they do a lot of work on this, but I. I I think in this case it just makes sense to do this with with the expense of a one acre park to maintain and, and the addition to six units. My question would be, are the six units added to the low income group or are they on the, the me medium income uh, market rate? Market rate okay. single family. Uh, okay. Council member, uh, friend. Yeah, so it's going to be part of the regular market rate single family residential units. Yes. Okay. Council Mr. Member. Mayor, if I may, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Councilman Valdivia. One of the things that I think that also is important tonight is that um, Clay's Park and Recreation Commission and the Planning Commission um, are going to be getting together, I don't know if it's this month or the following month, to actually talk about these issues so that we can all be on the same page. I mean, that's one of the things that we that could have been where there might have been some disconnect. Um, so we want to make sure that we're doing, uh, from the Planning Commission's perspective, what the Park and Recreation Commissions are expecting and vice versa. So, okay. Thank you. Council Member Valdivia. Yeah, I have no comments. I think it's a good uh, uh, proposal and a way we can open up to a hearing. Okay, well, okay. I'd like to make, a, I will in a second, okay. just to make a comment personally, I, I just, I like seeing little pocket parks. What I'm seeing here is, and I know the grand plan, but the reality is 
when is a five acre park going to be built? We're going to have 75 homes there. A lot of kids and no place to go other than finding a uh, school there. I think I understand the, the big plan is to get these regional parks, but at the same time, we have smaller communities within. I like to see these things start. You know, we talked about private development. You know, a development this big should be a private development, HOA, their own park, maintaining their own streets. I mean, we need to get to the point of letting the developers pay for these things as soon as possible. I just don't see a five acre park happening within the next three to five years within a half mile from from this development. Maybe I'm wrong. Is there plans for a five acre well, park we have, within we, yeah, we'll, five we'll, years? We have an expansion of the Southeast Area Park. I'm not, is that what we're I can't rem remember now what we're formally calling the Southeast Area Park. But you know, with the construction of Award Homes, we're going to be working on that. To, you know, where the where the whale um, water right. feature is. Okay, so keep in mind that's about two and a half. So again, with the council's approval um, during the the development uh, agreement with West of Fairview. You know, there's another two and a half acres is going to be a part of that park. So yeah, I mean that is the goal. We are trying to get those five acre parks um, pursuant to, to the Mark Parks Master Plan. And again, I understand, Mr. Mayor, uh, what you're saying on, on those those smaller areas. It's just that with the way that the the city's funding is for for those things, that I would rather I would rather not have a pocket park than have a pocket park look bad. Because there's nothing worse than a community when you drive by a dead, you know. Where there's grass that's dead. <laughs> it, true, and again, you know, it's it's for us to find better ways mm -hmm. to maintain our parks. That is what our community is about. We have to have a place for our residents to go and enjoy time off of work with their families. But the reality is, you want to come home for work, uh, get your kids on the bikes, and go down the street a few blocks and go to a, a park right in your neighborhood. They don't have to be these larger parks. I mean, we're talking maybe smaller than the six lots, but something where the little ones can go. And I, I think there's room for both. And I think we can build parks now that don't cost as much money to maintain if we plan them wisely, my opinion. So thank you for that. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and open this up for uh, the appeal hearing. Are there any speakers? I have no speakers cards. Okay, at this point, I'm going to close it for the appeal hearing. Motion to approve resolution 2013-145. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Let's move forward to F1. <coughs> Why don't we take a, a couple minutes so we let everybody, all the young ones, exit while they got a chance? Because it's in the city, they, we don't have to own the property. Well, the property's already gone. Okay, so they're going to have to maintain the park. Okay. Yeah, they're going to have to maintain the street. Yeah, they're going to have to maintain the street.
Okay, let's move forward with item F1. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, this item is a continuation from the last meeting where requests were made for the council to approve a transfer of property associated with, associated with the LaSalle treatment facility. Um, information was requested. That information was provided to the council over the past couple of weeks. Um, as well attached to your packet for tonight's communications. Um, the staff recommends that the council approve the continuation of the transference of that property. And, and this evening we have um, all of the managers involved with the HUAP program itself that are available to answer any questions that the council may still have remaining with regard to that transference issue. Okay, thank you very much. Council Member Gomez? No questions. Council Member Scatini? No questions. I have all my questions answered. Councilmember Friend? No questions. <laughs> Councilmember Valdivia? No Do we have any speakers? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, Marty Richmond. <laughs> I had the question, but I <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I have no doubt uh, where I stand on this. Uh, it's me against that old group over there, and they're getting paid by me. So I don't see how I can win because I'm paying their salaries and uh, I'm paying their benefits and I'm paying for them to come in here and argue with me. But I appreciate them showing up and I'm glad they came to the Board of Supervisors the other day and begged for forgiveness for $48,000 worth of work that needed to be done. I appreciate it, but we love to see the millionaires row over here of fighting with me over over the uh, thing. I had two simple questions of which I didn't get, I didn't get any answer. One was what's the value of the salt plant that we're letting go? And the second one was, do we have any guarantee that this, the water we were getting before, not the new salt plant, the old water, that price is not going up based on the fact that we're relinquishing uh, our, uh, our half of the plant. And I'll take those after I sit down, but before I leave, I wanted to say there's a reason for those questions. And the reason is the defense of what I consider a poor job of planning the cost of this program. And I know Harry will come up here and tell you how much money he saved us. Uh, the, the, the defense is that four, four of you, I didn't say four, he said four, Four of you went to all the meetings. I bet you you didn't know what you were signing on for because I know it, because I would have heard from you. I would have heard somebody say, well, you know, your water rate's going to double here in five years or ten years. We didn't hear anything until they came up with the guy who had the little chart that said, we're buying a, a plant, and oh, by the way, look at what it's going to cost to run that plant. Shock, shock, okay? And that's my problem. My problem is not what you go out and pay to put a plan in. My problem is what it's costing us to run that plan. And I know people take it personally when you talk about how much money they make, but I don't mean it personally. All I'm telling you is 19 employees at the uh, Sunny Slope Water District, and I know they do a lot of stuff by contract, and the manager makes more money than a four-star general. Okay? Now, we complained, the four of you, or five of you, I, I'm not sure that uh, the mayor was here at the time, I don't think he was, complained like crazy when we found out that the president of Gavilan College, with their 599 employees, made $240,000 a year. People were passing out in the street 
Okay, so there's 19 employees over at the gentleman here in 2011 made 211,000 and with benefits was another 74. So he made 284. God bless him. And if he can get him to give him 500, I hope he does. But somebody else has got to be on the other side of the program. Someone has to say, enough of this. Water is a mandatory thing. You can't live without it. It's impossible that in a county that only has 56,000 people, that we've got layered water people all over the place making a fortune when you add it all up. <coughs> I don't get it. And finally, my last statement is, when we ask the Sunny Slope Water District to help us out, by taking off a piece of the wastewater plant, I went to that meeting, and I don't remember anybody else being in that meeting but me from the council. And here's what the people of Sunny Slope Water District said. We don't want to deal with anything that has to work with the Hollister City Council. But we find ourselves crawling in bed with them to our detriment and enormous cost. Hey, one hand washes the other in this life. If they don't want to work with us, why are we just rolling over and working with them? I know why. Because of that lineup right there, all the experts say, you have to do it. And you don't have any choice. Because they're going to hold the pistol to our head from the city. Now, I know it's going to get voted in. I understand. I just think the public needs to know. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, there was a couple of questions there that I think uh, there were, we need to I have think answered clearly. Harry is probably the best capable on his feet currently well, um, to answer those questions. Okay. And Mr. Reidenauer, I'm sure, would love to. So the first uh, question was for Harry. Harry is, yeah, Harry's going to tackle the value of the, of the value. Less salt. Okay. But before Harry talks about the value of the less salt, and I know it wasn't necessarily a question that Marty had, but I think it is something that needs to be addressed. and. Um, one of the things working for the public sector that's probably more frustrating than anything else is, is you know, having your annual wages or your salaries and benefits out there for everybody to see. You know, obviously most corporations don't necessarily have to do that. In the case of Don's, um, I believe the that the information that Marty has provided in some of the letters is based on a single year highest average that Brian Yamaoka, or the former executive manager of the uh, Sunny Slope County Water District got when he retired, which included his annual base salary, uh, the, all his vacation pay, and I think probably some of his sick pay that he got bought out. I can tell you right now that Don does not make over $200,000 a year. He is far from making $200,000, and when Marty says that what his perceived annual uh, salary is, actually what Marty should do is go directly to the district. And that's because it is public. But we can't go off of internet sites on state controllers reports or wherever else Marty's getting it from. Okay. It's not the case. So well, let's, let's do this. Let's hear from Harry and Don, if you don't mind, coming up in a bit and we can talk about it. This is, again, it is public information, so it's nothing anybody's hiding. So let's understand these things clearly because the public does deserve to know. All right, the, the first question that I'd like to address is the valuation of the uh, existing facility at less salt. And then uh, the three of us uh, will talk about the uh, potential uh, cost impacts to the, to the three parts. So the, the first part is the um, valuation. In fact, there was a valuation done and that was explained to uh, Council Member Scatini uh, last week. <coughs> and we did that uh, just before the statement of intent was, was finalized that you all approved. And the um, valuation at that time was a range, and it was between uh, three and a half and four million dollars. And the way we did that was that we asked our uh, water treatment plant consultants, HDR, based upon their experience to evaluate the equipment, the age of the facility, uh, the fact that it had to be upgraded, and there's no land included in that um, estimate that I just gave to you. But it, it was assessed at three and a half to four million dollars, and I understand from your staff uh, that 
the value that you're carrying on your books is today, the depreciated value is about 3.1 to 3.2 million dollars. The, the, <coughs> the unstated um, problem with that is the uh, transfer of the facility at no cost to the um, water district, Simity County Water District. And in fact, that is not the deal, as I explained to uh, you. I think that the members of the um, governance committee at that time were Doug Emerson and Pauline was on the, the governance committee at that time. And we explained that everybody's putting something in the pot and that the um, San Diego County Water District is putting in $10 million. The other agencies are contributing <coughs> their, their shares of the less salt facility and that uh, the difference is made up from uh, the, the financing package that, that we've all heard about in the rate studies. And so the grand total of all of those parts, I won't bore you with the details, is about $30 million. And that the uh, agreement was that we'd have a partnership and it would be shared one-third, one-third, one-third. So the, the uh, Seminary County Water District contributed its $10 million and each of the remaining two agencies then made up the difference with the $10 million and included $10 million each. And included in that was the each's contribution of the less salt facility. So in fact, there is a, a fair exchange of, of value of the facilities. The next part was that, uh, um, was the our governance committee um, apprised in some way that there was going to be a rate increase and that there were uh, three components to the costs. And I can assure you that they were informed on several occasions. Now, no one is implying that all four of you that were members at various times heard it at the exactly the same time, but you're all part of the governance committee and you heard that story, I'm sure, on several occasions. And so there was nothing done in secret. As far as I could recall, there was only one citizen who consistently attended those meetings during that period of time, and that's Marvin Jones. Nobody else did. Now with that, I'd like to uh, uh, turn it back to you because I think there's some questions on the maintenance component, the o and component, and uh, Mr. Wright and our salary, and then the potential cost of water that both Jeff and, and Don Wright and our can address. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and uh, City Council members. Uh, first, I'd like to address the, the O&M component uh, cost. Uh, you know, Sunny Slope County Water District is going to be paying half of these O&M costs. Sunny Slope County Water District has been paying half of the cost of the operation of the salt water treatment plant since uh, it's since it was put into service in 2002. So we have 11 years of providing service uh, to the city as well as to our own customers. So it's any cost that, that we escalate in any fashion, first of all, will be reviewed by a committee that was called out and, uh, and required as part of the water supply and treatment agreement. But, uh, and so, so your managers as well as San Benito County Water District's managers will get a chance to weigh in on, on what our costs uh, will be operating this treatment plan. But more importantly, we're gonna experience half of those costs ourselves. Um, now, to my salary, you know, it's, it's always, I would just assume someone come directly to myself and I can give them accurate current numbers on what my salary might be and any of our, uh, our staff, because uh, I have provided that to members of the public upon request, and I currently make $158,099.88 in cash. That does not include my benefits. Um, I know where uh, you're, your previous speaker got his number and, and he's taking a number from 2011, which I wasn't employed in this county in 2011, but he was, as, as your uh, uh, interim city manager stated, uh, 
calling out a, a salary that includes buyout for someone who retired at the end of 2011. So it's a bit of a distortion of facts. Um, when the, the information is readily available, what someone has to do is ask for it, and, and I'll provide it because it is public information. Um, so, and I can say, I don't charge any time to the salt water treatment plant right now. We haven't even charged an administrative cost to the city or to a sunny slope for the operation of that plant for the last 11 years. We are looking at what our fair administrative costs might be. But right now, I haven't, I've never charged an hour of time to the oper operation of the saltwater treatment plant to date. That may change when we're looking at these costs in the future. But I might add that these cost estimates that were provided to you in your uh, water rate study, as well as were provided to Sunny Slope for uh, setting water rates and estimating water rates into the future, they really are based on a plant that is not yet built, and it was they were estimates that were that weren't provided by Sunny Slope County Water uh, staff, but were provided by HDR, uh, our consultants who were helping us plan these facilities and in some cases design these facilities, and specifically with LaSalle Water Treatment Plant helped us value engineering and reduce the costs of of uh, the capital. Uh, construction as well as the operation costs of that plant. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any more questions you might have. Before, uh, maybe you can talk about the, the old water pricing compared to the new pricing structure. Um, with the, the old water, you know, one of the, in looking at some of the tables in your, in your water rate study is, you know, you see some fairly large increases and it looks like it's all attributed to LaSalle. But what's also included in that line item is it's not the same treatment plant, first of all. It's an upgraded plant that will meet uh, new and more stringent water quality regulations. But it also includes a whole new water treatment plant, the West Hills water treatment plant, that will <coughs> also be under construction in the next year or so, and its operation costs. It, currently, we're treating somewhere between 1,600 and 1,700 acre feet a year at LaSalle, and we'll continue to treat about that same amount in the future. We'll just have an upgraded plant that will meet state uh, water quality re regulations. But we're also increasing the amount of water that we'll be purchasing and treating at the West Hills water treatment plant, and it'll be just under 4,700 acre feet. So we're nearly tripling the amount of water, just under three times the amount of water that we'll be treating. So there are a lot of costs going up, both to meet you know, future regulations, but also to, to pay for a new treatment plant that will be uh, under construction sometime in 2014, and the water that will be run through that plant. So, so those are those are why some of those costs look like they're jumping so, so, uh, so sharply. Won't the cost of operating a new plant be less than the old plant that we're running now? Um, the technology caught up with that world. Well, there's more components to the new plant, and there's more components to the upgraded LaSalle treatment plant. We're adding additional filters uh, to remove. Uh, 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 organic material so that we can stay in compliance with dis disinfection byproducts. So, so this new plant, both the upgraded LaSalle and the West Hills, will be more expensive uh, to run than what we've experienced with the LaSalle water treatment plant in the past. We're essentially leaving the exist existing uh, microfilters in place. They'll be the finishing uh, filter, but we'll have two sets of filters that will help uh, uh, remove other, other elements in the water prior to those filters. So we'll still have the cost of those filters plus two other trains prior to them at LaSalle. And then West Hills is a whole new facility, so we haven't experienced those costs yet. Council Member Valdivia? No questions. Council Member Gomez? No questions. Thank you. Council Member Scatini? <clears throat> I just want to make a statement. Uh, I spent uh, two and a half, three hours with Don, Jeff, and uh, Mr. Harry. Mr. Harry Hill were there. And, um, I, I had all my questions answered, and some of it uh, I was really, it was, uh, it was, uh, I have been there before through these meetings and stuff, but that's been a long time ago. So I, I want to say that everything, my, my concern of the last meeting was completely answered professionally by these three gentlemen. And uh, I, I want to thank you for taking your time and explaining that stuff to me, because you guys did a great job. Yeah, our pleasure. Thank yeah. you. Well, I have a, you know, I had, People ask me questions. I think it's you know, for the sake of clarity for the community. Again, I think the confusion is why are we doing it? Why don't we just wait? 
but some questions have come out, and I think you answered part of it is part of the cost is we're purchasing more water, mm -hmm. correct, so that we're not having to treat or go through the process of so much salt from the wells. Correct. I think one of the questions that, that somebody had called and um, left a message for me was, well, wouldn't it be cheaper to buy everybody these new high-tech softeners <coughs> rather than building a plant? Would that, how do you answer a question like that? Now, I haven't been through that analysis, but I, I know that analysis has been done, and, and we even looked at that at Sunny Slope with our wastewater customers, because the end, end result we're looking for is to meet the wastewater discharge requirements of, of our wastewater plant as the city will be doing with their wastewater plant. And um, it isn't enough. The water coming out of the ground here is just too salty. And, and then you, you're, you can't help but to add a little bit of salt when, when you pass through someone's home with uh, cooking, cleaning, washing, food preparation, but then you add the water softener, uh, salt discharge, even with even with the newer versions, and it's still just too salty. I mean, we, it was some analysis that Sunny Slope did prior to my time, back when they paid their general manager a lot more money before I arrived. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to add to that, so th does that mean we're going to be pumping less water from our own wells? That's correct. Is we'll that be the pumping idea? substantially less water from our own wells. With, with the, these two treatment plants, right now we're about one third surface water or a little less to, and to two thirds groundwater, and, and it'll be reversed. We'll be providing about two thirds surface water to our customers, about one third groundwater. Um, and we have further goals of moving that surface water uh, percentage higher, and we expect new development to pay their share of, of future plant expansions and pipelines that will bring that surface <coughs> water uh, percentage up so that we can meet our wastewater uh, discharge requirements and provide a better quality water to our customers. And I guess the last question I would have, is there any other way to meet the state requirements without doing all this construction? Um, the only other way that, again, Sunny Soap looked at before they were partners in this uh, Hollister Urban Area Water Project is we looked at going it alone uh, and we looked at treating groundwater and it was very rough estimates at the time, and these estimates are old. It was the same price for just Sunny Slope to treat its groundwater or more. And, and treating groundwater and removing the salt, essentially, and other elements at the wellhead is just very, very expensive. It, it's more like what you see over on the coast with these agencies in Monterey and Santa Cruz County looking at uh, desalinization. Essentially, it's a form of that. And what happens is then you have a dist you have a waste product. You you've filtered out all these constituents and the salt. What are you going to do with all the salt brine that you've that you've uh, filtered out? You're going to have to haul it away, or you're going to have to pipe it somewhere. And we looked at deep ground injection. We looked at lots of things. It was very very expensive. And I think these agencies along the coast that are looking at desalinization, they're only doing it because they don't have another option. Um, we're very fortunate in this county that we have a surface water option and that, you know, our predecessors planned for and looked and, and brought in federal water project water and that we have that option to go to. Uh, these agencies on the, on the coast, they're, they're looking for some, I mean, they're going to see some very difficult decisions when it comes to uh, providing their communities with drinking water. So we, we are not the only community. I, I mean, I, am I... Right, and assuming the other communities now are going to have to do the same thing, and they're going to see those increases also, yes. or are we so far behind? Yeah, they, they, your other communities are going through this as we are. Uh, we're not so far behind. We're, we're behind some of the larger agencies. These regulations, they usually give you time to comply. Um, as I know has been uh, reported to this council and, and has been discussed at length with my board, Sunny Slope is currently out of compliance with our waste discharge requirements, and we have been since 2008. We've, we've essentially been receiving some regulatory relief. That was another thing that was brought up to this council as, as well as to my board, is we have been uh, receiving some regulatory relief, and they haven't been finding us or shutting us down um, because they see progress we're making, and these agencies really like to see progress when you have multiple agencies working together because they know it's more it's it's more it's financially feasible when we're working together rather than small agencies like Sunny Slope or or the city or you know other agencies going it alone and trying to solve these you know these really expensive problems independently that's all the questions i have any other questions from mm -hmm. oh. <coughs> thank you
Oh, you just dropped a stack of bills on the floor, oh. Don. <laughs> 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 On a, on a separate note, uh, and not for the purpose of extended discussion, but the city still is in the need of producing groundwater in, to supplement the, the volumes that we're speaking of here with surface water as part of the HUOP program. So in the future, Council will receive some requests, um, again, for those capital improvements necessary to sustain that groundwater system um, that provides not only the supplemental water to meet our demand, but also to provide us with emergency planning and also to serve different areas that currently the, the distribution systems have a difficulty in serving. Um, second point with regard to the soft water conditioner issues, um, with that groundwater in mind, it still will be necessary to get a handle on the soft water conditioners <coughs> in the future as well too. So in the near future, staff will be presenting to council an ordinance for consideration of, again, not necessarily restricting their use, but requiring um, greater technologies in terms of offsite generating systems. And, and so just a little bit of heads up, I guess, with regard to future groundwater issues. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. I make a motion to uh, uh, to approve resolution number um, 2013 Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Mr. Scatini. Okay, let's move forward on to item F2. Apparently, Rudy doesn't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess I'll do it. <laughs> he, he won one. He's leaving. <laughs> this the, the, item before, the, the item before you uh, counseled this evening is to essentially um, get authorization to par uh, paint the curb red um, adjacent to the Vista Meadows uh, driveway. Uh, we had a speaker. Um, I believe at two council meetings ago, we acknowledged that there was a problem. We made sure that it was going to be feasible. Again, this is just authorization for us to do, it, do the work order. Okay. Are there any well, don't, questions? Don't come in now. I, Go ahead. It's been covered. It's been covered. Is do there that. any can, uh, well, questions from council? No, I make Cal the motion that we approve it. I'll I'll second. Re resolution. Uh, what's the, what, 2013. 2013-147. 147. 147, yes. Okay, is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you very much. I think the staff should be commended for jumping on this. I mean, within two council meetings, the, uh, all the people that came before us complaining about this uh, line of sight issue with the people parking there. Excellent. Mm. Excellent. Thank work. you. Absolutely good work. You're absolutely right. Actually, actually, Jerry gets some credit, too, because she let us put it on late. <laughs> well, and I have to acknowledge that staff has been in contact with the lady that spoke, and, and she's been very uh, receptive and thankful. Okay, perfect. Let's move on to item G1, reports from city council committees. Council Member Gomez. Do you have anything to report? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I attended, sorry, I was trying to gather my thoughts. Uh, so I attended uh, AMBAG last week, and there was uh, a round of excitement, as always. And uh, so the regional, uh, um, the um, regional transportation sustainable community plan was finally um, adopted, which uh, to me pretty much means nothing. So um, there's this whole plan, and the federal. And so now staff gets to go back and um, start working on the plan that's gonna that has to be completed in another five years. Uh, through federal grants, so now a few more people will get to keep their jobs for another five years so they could um, give us suggestions on where uh, our tr uh, transportation infrastructure needs to be and where we should grow uh, residential, have residential growth and economic growth and, and all that good stuff. So anyway, that's what happened. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Council Member Scutini. <coughs> no, no uh, comments, no committees. So that's me. Council Member Friend? No, no report. <coughs> I have a report from Intergovernmental Committee. We met to discuss the uh, moving forward on the Pinnacle National Highway. 
project, the uh, committee agrees that we should keep moving forward for the sake of uh, future tourism. It's interesting to see what happens as, as time goes by and we start getting more information. It turns out some of the, uh, there are people out there against the idea because they felt Airline Highway was historic, the historic name of the, uh, the road. Well, it turns out before it was Airline Highway, it was actually Pinnacles Highway. And there's a photo of the ribbon cutting um, back in the, the 30s not to take away the importance of the, uh, the value of, the historic value of airline highway, but the Pinnacles National Highway is our chance, our opportunity to start working towards bringing people to our community to show off the uh, a national park. Uh, we have so many things here in our community, the wineries, Hollister Hills, and hopefully uh, some other areas will open up for off-roading in the near future. But the Intergovernmental Committee has uh, decided to move forward on, on the process and start working with the public on uh, any other ideas that they might have. So that's my report on, on that committee. Was there any mention as to why it was named Airline Highway? There's no airlines around. Right? It, I can tell you the story on the Airline Highway name. That came about because there was a bus company that started shoveling uh, people from San Francisco to Los Angeles, and they decided they could save some miles by crossing through here to Kalinga rather than going around on the other highway. They'd save 10, 15 miles. So this company was named Airline, the Airline Bus Company or mm -hmm. something like that. That's how that name came It doesn't sound very out. historic to me. What's that? It doesn't, so, it doesn't sound very historic, no. Well, <laughs> and you that company was around for about 10 years before. And that's my business folded. address. You totally so. killed it now. It's like so boring. <laughs> That's why you're named Airline Highway there at your business. <laughs> wow. for, for a bus company. Yeah. So th there you go. Maybe we could change it to American Airlines Highway or something. Get a sponsor for it. All right. So let's move on to uh, G2. Uh, is there anything you'd like to mention, Councilmember Gomez? Uh, no, events? I do not. Councilmember Scatini? Uh, I just want to say that, uh, yeah, uh, Ray, uh, Ray from the county did a lot of extensive work in doing the background and checking on that airline highway and he came up with, he spent a lot of time on that and came up with the facts and if you want a copy nice. of it, he can give you a copy. That's, I have nothing else to say. Okay, Council Member Friend? No, nothing. Else. Actually, I'd like to say, actually it was Charlene, uh, our local historian that pulled up all that information and For Ray? distributed it to all of us so we could uh, take a look at it. I'd like to uh, repeat something that was mentioned earlier. This weekend, Saturday the 21st, between 8.30 and, and 12, they will be asking or they're looking for volunteers to come out, out to help <coughs> Sergeant Jurgens with his home, a uh, beautiful home that's been built rather quickly. A lot of volunteers locally have helped out. A lot of companies have helped out. So they're asking for the public to come out and put a little time in to help this uh, this person that gave everything he has for our country. So if you can find the time, please come out. It's a very uh, worthy cause. So thank you very much. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. I have a, a several small things. Again, uh, there's a Complete Streets um, uh, workshop tomorrow that takes place at Rancho San Houston Middle School from roughly 5 to 8.30. Um, I wanted to let you folks know that the house that's located at 1148 San Benito Street that was a partnership between uh, the city of Hollister and Chispa uh, is now in contract, uh, should be closing probably within the next 30 days. Um, the sales price is um, what we actually got, what the asking price was at 245. Um, if you'll recall, our, own, uh, our note is for 106. So once it closes, um, the city of Hollister will be receiving those funds. At our last council meeting, you heard some public comment about Hill Street and the park and, and uh, the sort of the perception that possibly that there was the city rezoned to sell the community park for multifamily housing. Um, we've gone back and, and that, that is not necessarily the case. Um, the general plan has um, that area designated as uh, public facilities because um, that's where our offices were 
there may have been a mapping error. Well, there was a mapping error that was done on the actual zoning map. Again, the, uh, the community park is not zoned R4. It really is part of just our public facilities up there. So um, in order for us to change that, it's a lengthy process. Um, and of course, you <coughs> folks know what it takes to actually sell a piece of property that's owned by the city of Hollister, which also takes a, a couple few months as well. So just to put everybody on notice at, on, on Hill Street, um, that that is not necessarily the intent, nor has it been the intent of the city of Hollister to uh, sell that prop sell that property and and develop a multifamily uh, uh, housing on on the hill, on Hill Street. Mm -hmm. um, some good news we have. Um, uh, some of you folks have, may have heard that we did actually receive an award from uh, the Community Development Block Grant. Uh, the city was awarded one uh, one million nine hundred ninety four thousand eight hundred eighty two dollars. Um, <laughs> I didn't do any of it. Um, a lot of thanks goes out to, to uh, Mary Paxton, Renee Perales, uh, Trisha Lee, um, Maria Men uh, Mendez. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting. Oh, I think Charlene, um, uh, or I mean Cheryl Mullen helped on it a little bit. So um, it, it, was, it, it was a total team effort. Um, the three organizations that are going to benefit from this is the Youth Alliance, um, Havana's de Antonio, and um, uh, the Food Bank. So, and the food bank actually gets some operating money as well as a facility. Uh, so that's going to be, that's actually pretty exciting. Can we get a picture of all those people at help <coughs> and put it out there in public so they can, yeah, that's awesome. we can show them off. These guys did a great job. I'm not this. so sure any of them really want to. Well, they're going to have to take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> Next newsletter. Uh, Next, we, there you we, go. They did a great job, so. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not sure if, if the council wants sort of we get updates on the PG&E uh, abatement project over there. If you'd like me to do that, um, it, it, it can, it's continuing on. Uh, some of the an anticipated impacts that we're going to see over the next week or so is, is uh, basically some parking spaces along Sixth and Sally uh, might be fenced off for the construction. There's going to be continued truck traffic entering and departing uh, with the removal of ho hauling off of the of the soil and 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 other materials um, and. The other impact is probably just going to be continued noise. Um, there's no health and safety issues over there as it relates to any air quality. The project manager has been sending out updates. Yeah, and I think, I'm not sure if we all get them. I just thought maybe I'd do it for the community. Um, the last one is, as I kind of promised, um, just a snapshot shot on, on, on the sewer rates. And one of the things that I, I think gets lost is, is that the city council needs to be commended um, on this. Uh, and I'm only going to give you one customer class because it seems to be the most, um, it, it's the one that I think counts the most. Um, in 2006, the city council adopted new sewer rates, and obviously that was part of a major program to build the new facility. Um, it was a, basically it was a five-year implementation of, of a new rate plan very similar to what you just adopted with uh, the water rates. Um, the initial year coming out of the gate, which was fiscal year 06, 07, the, the rates jumped to $46.33 for a single family home per month. Um, the fifth year uh, implementation of the plan, uh, or actually the fourth year implementation of the plan was $124.40. Um, currently, a single family resident is paying $86.32, which is actually less than the projected or uh, yeah, I guess the projected amount for fiscal year 08, 09. So five years ago, we are still less than the projected amount for our wastewater um, for the customer service. And that, I think, is a direct reflection of a couple of things. One is, is your direction, um, the operations and maintenance of the facility, and the fact that, yeah, we are keeping an eye out. And I'm not going to pretend like $86 is cheap. That's not the point here. The point is, is that the city of Hollister um, does not just <coughs> implement fees and rates because they can. They implement the fees and rates that's necessary to cover debt service and operations. And that's, that, what, that's one of the things that I think that you have to see commended for. So um, with that said, I've said it with the water rates. I know people think that they're going to double. They may double, but the, ap the, 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 the fact of the matter is, is that we will do everything that we can to make sure that rates continue to stay as low as possible, period. <coughs> so that's it for my report. I, I just have a comment. I'd like to see a report from me back about those rocks, the removal of those rocks next meeting. <laughs> okay. City Attorney? I <laughs> okay. Chief? I've got a couple of things. Uh, this weekend we had a community cleanup again. Our second one this year, we did about 20 cubic yards of garbage and weeds. Um, in fact, I think uh, Carson over here got about 
at least 10 yards himself. Um, so it was a great, uh, great group effort by the whole community. Um, we also hit um, Park Hill as well, about a quarter of that. Um, we're going to have Coffee the Cops this week. It'll be at Mars Hill, 7 p.m. Right. on Wednesday. And then HDA has asked me to announce they're going to have their own downtown cleanup on the 26th of October, meeting the 400 block, um, actually right here, the corner at 8.30 a.m. And uh, they're asking, there's actually um, some stuff on our, on our Facebook pages to get some directions on what to bring. And then um, the last thing is um, I was reminded of a, uh, a recent fire back east where um, several family members were killed. And um, when the fire was put out, um, they located the fire alarm sitting on the table of the living room of this residence. So I would remind everybody to check their fire alarms, make sure they work, and uh, make sure they're operational as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, City Clerk. Um, thanks. I was also going to mention the, mention the Downtown Association, um, and that cleanup is in conjunction with Make a Difference Day, National Make a Difference Day. Um, and then the Downtown Association is also working on the annual Lights On celebration, so anyone that wants to participate in that should contact HDA. It keeps growing, and this year should uh, be better. And then I have the fair schedule. Fair's the first weekend in October, so see me afterwards so you can sign up to work your shift. And that's it. Put me down for a Sunday. You, you need that tonight, information? No, I just want it well, as soon as possible. Just so wants it in writing. Time. It's that's coming up fast. Oh. Is there any pay on it? It's all on it. No pay. It's really? volunteer. Rewarding. Community rewards. Okay, let's serve your community. Is that it? That's it. Thank you. All right, let's move forward to G3. Mayor and Council Member, this is a fairly uh, lengthy one. No, I'm just kidding. It's very short. We have uh, made our payment to the side fund uh, for 600000 and we plan to continue to look at any one times as we're closing the books, we're still doing for the final fiscal year any additional funds that maybe that are above and beyond what we budgeted and or um, any reimbursements just try to uh, bring that information to you uh, to, uh, to use some additional one-time monies to pay down side funds. We are also looking at um, if we can finance it, uh, those side, paying off those side funds. But right now what HERS is re revaluing their, uh, what the side funds are and also changing their um, actuarial assumptions. So right now it's kind of a tough time to to refinance things just because of how they're calculating. But we're kind of keeping our eyes open on that and see if there's any changes. Plus interest rates have kind of gone up and down. It's uh, it's kind of a tough time right now. So we're, our, we're sticking with trying to pay them down with uh, one-time monies um, whenever we can. So we're but still looking at them being paid down in five years. Correct, correct. But we made our first payment. Now, like I say, we're once we close the books, see if there's any additional monies. And then we're hoping to get some reimbursements from the former redevelopment agency with uh, ROPS, and, um, and there might be some additional monies there, too. Are there any other questions? I still would like to see proposals from a few companies okay. at refinancing this. I think we've lost several months here. You know, by my calculations, 2% of $10 million is quite a bit of money if we can knock those things down. Five years or not, that's, you know, if we look at five years, 2%, 10000000 million, we're looking at a million dollars there. So we could definitely use that money. Um, I'm glad we're being aggressive and, and paying this down, but let's just take a look at some some information from a few companies and see what, what can happen. Would it? You can't hurt to ask. No, nope, never. Okay. All right. Let's move forward. Thank you very much. Let's move forward to. Uh, I was going to bring a PowerPoint for you. <laughs> G4, please. Oh, don't sue the city. Well, workers' comp. G4, Halster Motorcycle Rally. Good, e good evening, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to just do a, I, I was in contact with uh, the promoter from Worldwide Dynamics um, late last week. He was uh, not coming to town until this week. I believe he's in town either tomorrow or Wednesday um, to get the final numbers on the expense and revenue section uh, portion of his 
um, dealings with the, the Hollister uh, uh, motorcycle rally. One of the things I can give you though right now, just kind of orally, I, I do want to, I do think it's only fair that I provide you with a written report um, um, giving an, uh, all the, the details of the rally itself. But real quick, what I'd like to do is, is just um, make sure that everybody is, is aware that part of the original agreement was is that the worldwide dynamic was um, uh, to give or uh, deposit within the city of Hollister $136,400 uh, prior to the event, uh, which he did. Um, the city of Hollister issued um, 122 business licenses uh, for the event, which brought in about $27,572. Uh, we had an additional uh, revenue source of building permits, a total of 42.47.29, in which the city of Hollister receives about 35, or which they do receive 35% of that, which is just about $1,486. Um, so there's there's those are the revenue sources. Um, the Chief and I are, are continuing to work on actual expenses from the city's perspective, but I can tell you, um, at least right now, that um, we are, are within the $136,400 budget that we projected um, prior to the event last year. Um, so we are looking, from a financial perspective, I can tell you that we don't believe that we're in the negative, of course, on this last rally. Um, in addition to that, I think we have our deal points set for uh, uh, the 2014 rally and, and, and we're working on getting that contract to you folks as quickly as possible, um, hopefully in the next month or so, so that we can ensure that um, um, there's plenty of time for proper planning, uh, but we also want to make sure that it, uh, this contract is, is, is a good solid um, uh, and beneficial to, to both parties. So um, that's it real quick in a nutshell. I, I know we have three weeks until my, our next council meeting and, and that's the council meeting that I would hope that the council will let me uh, provide you with an actual written report and so that you can see the costs um, um, that are associated with the rally. So if there's any other general comments, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them or Chief is here to answer some questions, but other than that, I'd like to put it off until October 7th. Okay, Council Member Gomez. No, I mean, I, I, had, I'm, I, I, I know that we're gonna be in the black and I don't have a problem with it. I don't, I don't think this is a, it should be a money maker for the city, for city government, um, you know, if, if as long as we break even, and you know, if we have extra funds and we could use them somewhere else, you know, in public safety or administrative stuff, whatever, that's fine. Uh, but um, you know, I think another thing that's going to be out of the equation is going to be the, like I said before, the residual impact, uh, fi the residual financial impact that we can't measure. You know, so that's something that, you know, I know. I'm assuming those are probably numbers that you were not going to be including uh, because those are immeasurable. But um, I almost wish we had some way of figuring out that spike or, you know, whatever it, 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 whatever it was. So anyway, that's just something to keep in the back of our minds when, when we get those numbers. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Council Member Scutini. <clears throat> yeah, I just want the chief to come back with a pretty, uh, re that report you're going to submit is going to be the chief of police report also? Yeah. He Yes, he's okay. the key. He's <coughs> the key guy. Okay. And the other thing I want to know: <clears throat> Has there been an audit of all this money? Do we have an audit Somebody of the money that came into the city? Yeah, I think audit the whole program. Yes. Well, I mean, uh, certainly we we can um, provide you with uh, the copies of the checks that Worldwide Dynamics had had given the city um, to to get to the 136. Um, certainly, finance can can show you. Actually, I have it right here. Uh, the list and names of the business licenses that were issued for that weekend. Um, if you would like to have, uh, I do have a spreadsheet from the building department that, that shows the, the, the building permits that were issued, and, and if you would like to have that information, I can give that to you. Okay, but yes, we do when have When you say building permits, what was being built? Oh, any, any, any temporary structure that's greater than 120 square feet has to get a building permit. Um, so a lot of your temporary or food vendors and some of those things all required to get um, a building permits. The stage, stages, had to get building permits. Anytime there's generators, electrical stuff that's going across, uh, they also um, okay. are required to get uh, uh, building permits as well. Yeah, I just, I just like to make sure that if the whole thing is audited, make sure that we're- Yeah, there, there's, not a lot of, there's not a lot of revenue streams for us, so that, for the, from an audit perspective, that's pretty easy for us to do. Okay. Thank good. you very much. Council Member Friend. No. Good, well thank you very much for that update. We'll move forward. Items H, I, J, and K, no business. Move for adjournment. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much.